scroll through these timestamps because we've got a five year in a work library Q and A special, all of the juicy questions that I don't get to talk about in regular videos in one take. God willing, we'll get through this. I've got 14, 15, 16 questions from personal life to professional life, all of my dark and very sad childhood trauma and then how I got myself up the healing mountain and now here I am helping other people do the same. Everything that pretty much my audience wants to know and maybe you want to know, this is part two of the Q&A series. Go onto my channel down below, you'll see me wearing a black shirt, it's about an hour and 11 minutes long. This one's probably going to be a similar length, you can see that, I don't know what it is at the time recording. Let's dive straight into it. It's going to be wide, wide, wide topics, but also very niche answers as well. Feel free to skip through, or put me in the background and go for a walk, or do the dishes, or whatever you choose to do. First question. How do you find time for this process? Did you previously work in a healing profession before transitioning into your current work? If so, how did you make that transition? And lastly, how old are you now? I'm 28 and a half at the time of recording, and did I previously work in a healing profession? No, I did not. This is the time to give a bit of a life arc in a few minutes of how I got to this point of being a 28-year-old life coach, teacher, therapeutic figure on the internet. It's been a pretty linear journey, if I actually condense it down. From 16 to 21, I was in school. Well, I was in school before then. I didn't just magically show up at school at age 16, but I did age 16. I made some choices about my options. I did history. I did business. I did German and I did computer science. I dropped the German in my second year in the UK. We usually drop down to three subjects at A level, and I specialized in history, computing and business, which meant that I was given the choice of where do I want to go for university? Um, I could do one of those three. And interestingly, believe that, but you're not going to believe this if you've been watching me for a long period of time, because I wasn't born into an educated family. I'm the first person from my family to go to university. I never saw anybody read a book like King Warrior Magician Lover, which we're going to go into later on, let alone pretty much any book at all, maybe a Christmas bestseller, maybe a biography of a celebrity. I remember my mom reading Twilight when it got popular. I, I wasn't around academics. I wasn't around education really at all. So until the final, I think it might be two weeks. I was going to say final week, but the final two weeks before the deadline, the deadline for applying to university, I didn't think I was going to do it. I was 17 years old. I had my sad, depressive energy, and I didn't think I'd be suited to going off to university despite having all of these pretty good grades. I just couldn't get myself to care about the future that much, which goes into my childhood trauma, dissociation, chronic depression, suicidal ideation stuff, which we'll talk about later in this video. But at age 17, nonetheless, I decided to apply for a history degree, and I received an unconditional offer from one of the top universities at a Russell Group in the UK, which is the equivalent of the Ivy League, not the top top, not Oxford Cambridge, not Harvard, Yale, but you know, top tier universities. I went to the University of Birmingham and I did a history degree. Went very well. Um, I objectively got the highest score from my cohort of history, ancient history, medieval history, uh, ancients, classics, I don't know, 300, 350 students. I got the highest grade at the end of it. I got a double first. I got the highest scoring degree. I got some prizes. Blah, 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 blah. I'm very good at reading books and then writing essays. And I did some scholarship things. I did history and I was good at history because I loved history. Thank God that I chose history. I could have gone for business. I could have gone for computer science. Interestingly, I'm now an entrepreneur who needs to use tech. So it all comes back in um, when you look at it from the wider picture. But I chose history because I'm interested in humans. And because I was interested in humans, I wanted to understand the wide span of human potential as it expressed in its lightness and mostly transparently in its darkness um, throughout world history. I primarily focused on war and suffering and genocide and conflict and the resolution or non-resolution of these issues. For example, in my final year at university, I did a specialist module for six months on the history of humanitarian intervention. So I looked at roughly um, conflicts from about 1945 to the present day and how various non-governmental organizations and government organizations either got over-involved, under-involved in the various networks of politics around the human story. 
And I loved that. And I thought for a period of time, maybe I'll go and work for Doctors Without Borders, but they don't accept people in the boots on the ground work if you're under age 25. So when I graduated, I'm age 21. That wasn't an option. What's the best next step to volunteering, getting some life experiences and doing some boots on the ground work? I went traveling, but not in a hippie backpacker, let's go get wasted on a beach in Thailand kind of way. I committed when I was 21 because I did very well in this history degree and I had the option to go and do masters and PhD and all of these different very, very good situations. I did very well at university, the best objectively, but I knew that my intelligence, my passion and my ability to focus on a plan and disciplinedly execute on the plan wasn't best served in a postgraduate degree. So I wanted to figure out where it would be best served and I thought a good interim for the next three years would be volunteering. So this would be work away, this would be woofing, this is help X. These are different organizations that help you to go to different farms around the world, mainly farms, sometimes in the city, um, and basically do volunteer work. You would work on average five hours per day, five days per week, and you would get your bed and your board, your food and your accommodation provided for. And you'd also get the opportunity to learn basic skills around whatever the thing you were volunteering for was. At age 21, I committed to do this for three years because I realized that my mental health and my spiritual purpose in the world were both pretty low. So rather than enter into a graduate career or enter into a postgraduate academic career, I decided to commit to three years off. And then if I really wanted to go into it, I'd only be 24. So of course I can go back to the university and say, hey, here's my graduation certificate. Remember me back then? Oh yeah, of course, because you still work here. It's only been three years and you were my tutor for two years. I, I knew I could get back into that world. There's nothing stopping me going back into an institution that's hundreds of years old. So I took the risk. I saved up money for multiple years in a row. I was very, 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 very frugal. Um, I was living off around £150 per month while volunteering my way around Europe. You ask, how can you do that? Because all you need to pay for is a flight from the UK into Europe and then you pay for a train and you stay at a place for three weeks or four weeks and then you get another train and you stay there and then you go another train and then you maybe got two nights in a hostel but then you go to a place. It's very, 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 very cheap. But essence of that story is I did 20 volunteer placements, mainly in Europe. I did two in Morocco. In Morocco, I did an artist residency for three weeks and I also did some English language teaching in English language school. My stayed in an English language school when I was doing some adult English learning things. I did artist residency when I was writing poetry, but I was there picking the olives. I did so many things. I did 20 in total. I was in Italy. I was in Germany. I was in Ireland. I was in Portugal. Where else was I? Wales. Doesn't matter. I mainly worked on farms. I did livestock. I worked. I didn't do the livestock. That's definitely not my thing, but I did livestock maintenance looked after animals, looked after land, learned how to build a home from the ground up in terms of alternative ways of building with natural materials, doing uh, mud and straw and doing different types of dirt compression, different ways of working with minerals to make buildings or look after the environment, different community projects. I did things like snail farming, olive picking, working in organic farms, a wide variety of things for two years. And then I got the message about a year in that all of my interest in psychology, which is what I was reading on my downtime, again, you have five hours of work per day, five days per week, you get a lot of free time to be able to think. Hint, hint, that's why I did it. My mental health was dreadful. I had a real ambiguous sense of, I know I'm meant to do something pretty meaningful and hopefully, God willing, somewhat remarkable in this life. Where should I put all this passion, all of this focus and all of this energy I know I'll choose a very cheap, very mobile way, a very grounded way of living for up to three years, get my hands literally in the earth and spend time out in the sun to heal the dissociative office light feeling that we're conditioned with for those entire school years from age four to age 21, if you finish university. And the free time was spent journaling. It was spent journaling, it was spent fasting, it was spent reading. And long story short, I reached the conclusion where I realized about six months before the travels were finished, that I needed to build the library. Initially, for myself, I wanted to go deeper than podcasts would allow. I wanted to go deeper than just the top 100 best-selling psychology books. I knew from my history degree that you can trace 
back the bibliographies to find the real source material. It's hard to say well, what is primary material and secondary material within psychology, for example, within history. The primary source material would be eyewitness real events. So it would be, for example, um, the World War I account from a a uh, soldier in the trenches or from a general, you'd compare the general's notes, you compare the soldier's notes, you compare some uh, fragments of artillery and you put together primary sources, whereas the secondary sources would be a book that a man wrote in the 1950s assessing the primary sources. In case you don't know about the difference in source material, in psychology you don't necessarily have primary sources, even if you went to Carl Jung or Sigmund Freud, they're referring to people who were writing in the 1850s, the 1880s, fun fact. If you ever want to know, I didn't plan for this, but this is a great book you can read. Um, you can read The Discovery of the Unconscious by Henry Ellenberger. It is a very fat boy, but you will be able to see how even Carl Jung's genius and Sigmund Freud's genius goes back to different movements in mesmerism and late Victorian um, psychological movements in the 1800s. Nothing is truly original. So I knew this and I decided to then build the library project and essentially get myself grounded in one place so I could focus and I could think. I did about a year of very, 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 very deep reading, and during this time I was sharing the process on Instagram, and a few friends would begin asking me questions at first, and then strangers would begin asking me questions, and eventually I realized, hmm, I should probably start asking for money in return for my advice and my guidance. So that's what I did. As I mentioned in the previous Q&A episode, you can Go watch it if you click down on my channel. It's very similar to this one. It's Jordan Thornton q and I'm wearing a black shirt. I talk in more detail about my research process over there. But how I got into the profession is something which is worth focusing on here. I just responded to the inner call to do something with my passion, my focus, and my desire to make an impact. Initially impact myself in a positive healing sense of that word. Make a healing impact on my own body, my own soul, my own psyche. And then when I got to a stage of health where I could be useful for other people, by God's grace, other people let me know. They just filled my inbox, not filled my inbox, a couple messages per week. And I just paid attention. And I, I was willing enough to accept 20, 30 pounds an hour to do a few sessions. And then I realized by reading a few entrepreneurial books and starting to read more therapist for therapist books or coach for coaches books that I could do this. This is probably my best professional avenue of expression for these various energies called Jordan. And I progressively stacked up my therapeutic skills, my coaching skills, my entrepreneurial systems. And I eventually then started um, going deeper on YouTube two and a half years ago at the time of recording and gradually built my channel to the size it is right now. And whenever you may be watching this, however big the channel may grow, and that's not in my control. But what is in my control is my intention to try and bring through what I've learned and what's worked for me in terms of my personal trauma healing in a way that can be Yes, focused on trauma healing, but also focused on the self-actualization, higher potential, best of transpersonal psychology, weave it all together, make entertaining educational information for free for many people online, and then, of course, work with my clients behind the scenes. That's how I got into this profession. Probably a crucial question that people would ask at this point, especially this person saying, how, um, how did I find time for the process and did I previously work in a healing profession before transitioning into your current work? I didn't previously work in a healing profession, but I did devote my entire life to healing myself for multiple years in a row. When I graduated university at 21 and I had the cap and gown and this incredible degree, I've got the transcript over in my desk, the highest scoring degree from top university in the world. And I knew inside that this depression, this sickness, this feeling of malaise, this feeling of pointlessness had to be solved because no form of external success could ever penetrate into that pit of desperation. I went all in. I externally went and traveled. I externally went and looked after the sheep in the field and I went over to Ireland and I did some snail farming and all these great experiences. And oh, look at me in Morocco, I'm doing English teaching and oh, here I am in Germany in this wonderful community. It's all secondary. That's what I was literally doing in the outer world, but on the inner world, that was where I was planting my seeds. Initially, I was doing a lot of weeding. I was pulling up the old dead parts of me and analyzing them and trying to understand where the sickness 
from this one plant went into the sickness of this oak tree over here, and oh no, the branches are coming down, and there's black leaves falling from the sky. I had to do that for a very long period of time. Again, as I've mentioned in previous videos, from age 10 to age 22, roughly speaking, I was very, very, very depressed and very dissociative, and I didn't want to exist. I went all in on healing that issue, and by virtue of me healing my own issues, people started asking for very simple human to human hey what did you do i've seen the change can you give me a bit of guidance and i had enough courage and confidence to create a system called coaching around that share of information that transfer of knowledge and i just kept doing it over and over again there's no certification i haven't got any formal psychological training i have a history degree i've never once pretended to have formal psychological training or any form of therapeutic credentials and for me that is authentic that's what i've needed to do to get into the helping profession or the healing profession because i believe that to be a good healer and a good helper you have to be the thing that you're transferring to the patient or the client i can't transmit this energy if i don't have it i could say the ideas but they will fall flat at your feet like an arrow that was intended to the target but it just never reaches no matter how much skill I might have from the therapy course or from the life coaching degree, it won't work. It won't work. It'll be shallow. It just, it, 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 it won't land. If you've ever been in a situation where you've worked with a coach or a therapist or someone who's professionally credentialed, but they're not the real deal, their words fall flat in front of your feet. You can see in their eyes, you can feel from their heart that they haven't figured out the issue that they're trying to help you figure out. So that's how I focused on it. I've, um, I got into this healing and helping profession by healing and helping myself. And naturally, I think the wound became the womb. They call it the wounded healer who then goes and heals their own issue to then help other people heal their issues. That's my path of mastery. Final part of this question, how did I find time for all of this process? I made it my number one priority and I refused to do anything else because everything else would have been pointless. I knew that after three years of travel, I could have gone back to university. But ultimately, if you look at what I've done with this channel over the last five years, I've laid the foundations for building my own version, energetically speaking, archetypally speaking, not legally speaking, no solicitors watching this need to think that I'm making this claim, but archetypally speaking, university-like experience. University-inspired. That's what I'm doing with my online curriculum. And I've built these foundations. I've built a library which for me has the energy of a true educational environment and i've benefited from that i've curated i've molded all these ideas together and now i get to share them so in a way i did become a university lecturer at least archetypally speaking and in a different way i suppose the therapeutic work that i do with clients i keep a constant client load and have done for nearly five years now I work in that therapeutic space and that healing space through virtue of living inside that energy myself, which makes it very easy for people to watch videos like this and say, hmm, I think that's my next step, rather than this name from a directory list who happens to have all the credentials, but they just don't, don't have that feel. So again, by God's grace, through intentional effort and maybe some good choices made at 21 and through a consistent process over many, many years and uh, thousands and thousands of hours of research. I'm in this position where I have become this kind of professional. I hope that answers the question. Very, very long question. I think it's the longest response we're going to have to start off this video, but who knows how long this might go. Let's go over to the second question. I'm going to take a sip of water or tea. Which one shall I go for? I've got two mugs. I'm going to go for the tea. You can see the question on the screen. I want to focus on how do you stay that productive and consistent with reading material? In the previous video, I said, how do you remember and incorporate books into real life? In terms of memorizing books, as I said over there, I don't aim for more than 10% on my first read. For example, if I'm reading King, Warrior, Magician, and Lover, I will go through the book and I will start making highlights. Interestingly, this book, I don't think actually has many highlights. It does. It has them in pen. It's before I started using the highlighters that I use. I'll go through, make highlights, active engage process. I try and get about 10% of the idea from the book. And then when I reread the book the second time around, I may get 20 to 25%. But for me, I incorporate the books into my real life by 
going through the ideas multiple times and also applying the things pretty immediately. It's, it's something we'll go into a bit later on. Let's focus on that first half of the question. How do you stay productive and consistent with your reading material? I hope I've expressed in that first long answer that this isn't really a choice for me. I don't know. I don't know how I remain this consistent. I don't have another option. Initially, it was through desperation. It was through a need, a deep need to figure out what's happened to me. Why am I the way that I am? Why do I feel alienated from my body? Why do I feel like a perpetual black sheep in every single room that I enter into? Why have I got this third dimension observing myself from somewhere above and behind my head kind of feeling? Why does the success with studies, with my sports, with women, why does it not work? That's why I had to remain consistent, because there's no other choice. I wake up, what do I do today? I've got enough money to be able to pay for my ben my bills, my, my food. No choice. There's no other choice. It's not difficult to remain consistent when you have desperation, and yet the interesting part for me is, well, what happened when I wasn't desperate? Once I'd reached probably about a year deep into this library process. And again, this is after multiple years of traveling and being very intentional with the fasting experiences, 25 to 30 fasts, constant reading, constant reflection, a lot of experience over there. You can see the previous Q&A down on my channel if you want to hear more about those experiences. Once I'd healed the desperation theme, I'd, the question's almost silly to me, and I don't mean to sound arrogant or condescending, but I don't worry about productivity and consistency. I am those traits because I love this work. My productivity isn't something which I measure myself against on a day-by-day -day basis. Either I'm exerting or I'm resting. Later on, we've got a question about this. How do I balance my inflow and my outflow? But my life is set within a very broad and yet very defined lane. And I know that when I wake up, when there's light in my eyes and I've had a bit of hydration, maybe a nice strong cup of coffee, I'm naturally going to start doing this work. There's nothing else that I'd rather be doing. Therefore, it's easy to maintain productivity and consistency. So if you're in a position like I was, where you're really desperate to try and figure out why you're a little bit screwed up and why things aren't fitting into place, let that desperation be your energy to propel you forwards. Let your consistency be woven into your pain. Yes, you're suffering every day, so why not do something to make it better? And then when you heal that heavy charge, when you're in a lighter, more loving place, let it be the love of life and the love of self, which puts a skip in your step as you head into your own library, as you pick up the book from your bookshelf, or you work with your client or with your uh, someone you're working with collaboratively. Let that be the natural uplift, the healthy urge to go for something which is good for you in the same way that you reach for water when you're thirsty and you go out in the sun when it's just been storming. There's a natural impulse. If you can listen to that natural impulse within for the healthy human being, you'll maintain productivity and consistency in the background. When it comes to inner work, you will maintain it, no question at all. I hope that's answered that one. Moving on to a related theme, I think I'll put this up over my face. I love how you organize your reading, why the equinoxes to separate. More important question, when you discovered the truth about how your parents treated you all your life, which was cruel and unkind, and you want to stay true to yourself, which is compassionate and loving, how does one interact with them? Even though you know you won't get your needs met, I still have a deep love for them. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them, which I'm grateful for, and my most challenging aspect of the recovery is staying in contact with them. How do you proceed even though torn in opposite directions? Fantastic question there about how to be in relationship with your adult parents as an adult who's experienced trauma, neglect, abuse, wounding, or some other significant rupture either once, twice, or many, many times over the course of multiple decades. How do we forgive and how do we stay in relationship with our parents? Fantastic question. I'm happy to share some of my personal story here. First part of the question about equinoxes and solstices. This is someone who saw my reading list. I do my reading in three month chunks and it's from spring equinox to summer solstice, summer solstice to autumn equinox. It's basically quarterly natural rhythms. It's just the natural cycle of the year based on real seasonal change. We all need a structure one way or another. I prefer doing quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four with the real quarters of the season. So that's why I do those things and it's spiritually significant in one way or another. Parents, how do you interact with parents who did you dirty? 
Um, how do you talk to a mother who abused you for many years? How do you forgive a father that wasn't there or any variant on the theme? For me personally, I have learned through my personal process of working with difficult aspects of my childhood that you need to pause and reflect on the nature of obligation and coercion. If you've got controlling, abusive, neglectful, manipulative, or otherwise unsavory parents, pause and ask yourself, what am I obligated to respond to? And then pause to ask yourself a different question. What is a true obligation versus a forceful obligation which has been thrust upon me? There are many forms of this. Societal narratives are sons and daughters should love their mothers and fathers no matter what. Family sticks together. You need to forgive your parents. That's all in the past now. You've got to be there for them as they get older, etc., etc., etc. Or maybe from the parents themselves. Like, look at how much I did for you. I looked after you when you were small. You look after me when I'm old. Especially if you're in your 30s, your 40s, or maybe your 50s. Your parents are old, older. They're, they're having health issues. What do you do when you're given that obligation to respond, but you've also got a difficult history from those first 20, 25 years? That's something that only you can answer. What I try and encourage for myself in my lived experience and for all the clients I work with is that make sure it's an authentic choice. Don't maintain a relationship with an abusive, neglectful, or otherwise incompatible human being called parent if it truly destroys your mental health. There's a spectrum of destruction. If you can't be in a room with a parent who did a horrific thing to you, maybe you shouldn't be in the room with them. You don't have to maintain a relationship. I'm thinking here of the most extreme circumstances, which may not apply to everyone watching this video. It doesn't apply to me. I, by, again, by God's grace, I haven't suffered a particular physical trauma in the most cruel sense, especially if it's an intimate trauma, especially a trauma at an early age. I haven't experienced that. I've experienced moments of physical abuse and moments of being, you know, I was raised by a certain type of father and a certain type where uh, hitting your kids around for discipline was the normal way of doing things. I had a good number of experiences like that or verbal abuse. I had those kinds of experiences. It's not the same as the full extreme, but on that spectrum of self-destruction, you decide for yourself how much of this am I okay with repeating in flashbacks and memories and conversations when I'm in a room or on a call with that person yet again. That's for you to decide. You don't have to forgive and you don't have to be obligated to maintain a relationship with any human being if you don't want to. And yet there's a caveat. In some situations, of course, the healing journey is to forgive those who've done you wrong. There is a beautiful, beautiful story. You see this every now and again, where, um, especially in criminal cases, where someone's lost a child to gang violence and they forgive the murderer and their former friendship or something like this. It's an exceptionally rare, almost way too hopeful story. How could you forgive someone who killed your child? And yet we see stories like this and we go, ah, that, that, that's the grace of God. That's a, a Christ-like energy to forgive someone who's caused great harm. To be able to look that person in the eye and say, I forgive you. I know that you were led astray. I know that that was ignorance, not malice. Can we apply that same principle to a parent who was abusive or neglectful, whatever degree along that spectrum, that's for you to decide. If it's a lower grade issue, you can probably forgive them. It might be a few years of distance, a few years of no contact, a few years of minimal contact. You can probably forgive. If they, if they just didn't know any better, you can probably forgive. And that's where I am personally. They tried their absolute best, both my parents. I just didn't bond with them. And it wasn't an environment that I related to. I never form those deeper connections because it wasn't the place for me. And there were some difficulties with my father's anger and my mother's anxiety and a variety of minutia around the periphery of that childhood story, which maybe I'll get into in the next question. But for me, forgiveness was possible, but just because forgiveness is there and I don't have a charge in my heart, and maybe you'll see this if I talk more about my childhood trauma, I'm still trying to figure out how to mention these things on camera to a wide audience. You'll see that there's not a, what's the word? There's not a resentful, vengeance-seeking energy. There might be sadness. You might see loss in my eyes. You might feel that I obviously am not so comfortable talking about these things. But that's not my permeating quality. That's not the level of consciousness that I live on in relationship to my parents. I think I've forgiven. I think I've forgiven. I think I've healed. But that doesn't mean that I'm 
chummy chummy with either of my parents and calling every week. I have a pretty distant relationship from my family system because I needed that personally to be able to pull myself out of a very enmeshed and very unhealthy family system. Maybe this goes over into the next question. It does. I would like to know about your childhood, especially those memories which change your personality in a major way. Also, my spiritual beliefs or practices. It's an interesting one because if you've ever read about childhood trauma and spiritual awakenings, they often tie tie together quite interestingly. Some of the most peak experiences of childhood are when we get glimpses of angelic or godly protection or a sense of divinity, especially if you're growing up in a dark environment. Usually a child needs at least one or two moments of contact with the otherworldly. In whatever form that might be, depending on the culture, you get a signal that you're going to be okay. And that gets you through the dark days. For me personally, my dark days raised in a more or less normal lower middle class, upper working class environment outside of Birmingham in the UK, which is right in the middle of England, just a very standard place. Um, nothing particularly to say about the location. It was a normal, by the looks of it, live in a home, two parents together, got a dog, eventually had two dogs, went to a school, one school didn't move, went to another school, stayed at that school. Parents stayed together, but it wasn't necessarily it wasn't. I'm, I'm, I'm minimizing. I've still yet to figure out, figure out how to translate these messages to camera. I'm fine in client sessions because I know who I'm talking to. And I know you're listening right now, but who else am I talking to? Thousands of people. And I don't want to uh, put out energy which is untrue or energy which could be misconstrued, more importantly. My childhood trauma, if I speak for myself rather than speaking on behalf of my parents about what they did or didn't do, fundamentally, I was dissociated and disconnected from myself and from my environment for pretty much all of my memory. I recently found out, very, very, very recently found out that my memory of getting glasses at age 11, this is significant, you'll come into it. It wasn't just that I had bad eyesight, that's not my whole childhood trauma, but it comes into it. If you've been watching me for a while, you're gonna enjoy this little bit of story. I have a memory of getting glasses when I was 11. And the first time that I got glasses, I don't know how it wasn't picked up until this stage in my life, but I got them and they were minus three prescription. Technically speaking, if you look at the 2020 vision slash 2200 vision, that's legally blind. If with glasses on, you see 20 out of 200, it means to see something that's 200 feet away with regular vision, you have to be 20 feet away from it. Whereas 2020 means that you're seeing in the right range. This is something where something's all the way over here. You still have to be right there to be able to see it. Legally blind is a categorization for people who even with glasses or corrective surgery still can't see. But I got these glasses when I was already minus three, I think maybe minus 3.25 or minus 3.5 prescription, which means that at least from the age of 10, from age of 10 to age of 11, I was experiencing the world as a legally blind child. And I thought it was just late childhood. For a long period of time, for most of my inner work in this library over the last five years, I thought that this probably started happening when I started playing more video games, when I started playing RuneScape when I was about 10 years old. I thought my eyesight must have gotten bad because I was staring at the screen. But surprise, surprise, my childhood trauma, as I've actually had a few more spontaneous awakenings, and I've been reading about um, attachment theories and what's happening with ego development during the rapprochement stage between 18 months and 24 months. In fact, to be specific, I was rereading my final second read, 164 second reads in the library. Um, this is my kind of research process. I was rereading The Ego and the Dynamic Ground by Michael Washburn. And there's this wonderful section talking about the rapprochement stage. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it super quickly. I don't think I am. No, you can just hear the pages, but this, this book is covered in highlights. I spent a wonderful period of time with this book only a few weeks ago, and I realized, based on some of the conclusions that Michael Washburn put together, that if the child doesn't bond with the parent between 18 to 24 months, they get stuck in perpetual ambivalence. So rather than going through the good father, bad father, good mother, bad mother, good self, bad self, classic splitting around the age of two, if for something, for some reason, something happens and they get caught in ambivalence, it doesn't complete. The ego doesn't develop in the same normal direction. Doesn't mean that ego doesn't develop, but something goes askew. And there was one particular sentence in there that got me thinking, hmm, I wonder if my eyesight was worse than I thought for much longer than I thought. And I started doing some more reflection and actually 
the main hint was that I had a habit of guessing. What I mean by guessing is that when I was at school, I would not know all of primary school. I went through classroom by classroom. I imagined my school. This is where the year six would be, then year five, year four. It's like a U shape like this. And I put myself mentally back in all of these classrooms throughout primary school between age four, age three and a half, until age 11. And I imagined all of the different sitting arrangements. And I could never see the board. And I developed all these habits of guessing. I had a habit of talking to the person next to me and asking what the page was on the, on the board for the textbook. I had a habit of not knowing when I was in the playground if I was approaching one of my friends or if it was a stranger. And imagine that experience of going up to who you think is your friend and you're saying, hey, John, hey, Joey, hey, Joe, and hey, you know, whatever filler name you want to use. And you get 10 feet away from them and you realize it's not them. What's that do to a child? Fundamentally speaking, this is a long way of me saying, I may have been born legally blind or close to legally blind. And my parents never picked it up. It's not their fault. I don't know how it wasn't picked up in the system. I don't know how a single teacher didn't notice that the, that, that little boy Jordan, he's always talking to his neighbor and there's always this pattern of him. I had these little things I'd do. I, new information for me, but I remember being as young as five years old, and because I couldn't see the whiteboard, I had this habit of pretending that I had something to put in the bin, because in UK schools, the bin would be in front of the board. So I'd have this to go into the bin, and I'd go over like this, and I'd put it down in the bin, I was like, oh no, miss, I'm just putting this in the bin. And then I'd see what's on the board, so I could get the textbook, and then go back to my seat. Had this habit. And I looked back to every single classroom, all the way through to the first classroom that I was in, and I remember that I couldn't see faces. Think of what that does to a child. Think of why I had these struggles with dissociation, disembodiment, and derealization. It wasn't that I left my body. It was I never properly went into my body, and the world itself never became clear. And I thought of what must have been happening in those early development stages, because I, I know 95% for certain, at least when I started school, I couldn't see clearly to the end of a room. I couldn't see faces. And if you know anything about attachment theory, you need facial contact. And if there's not facial contact, if there's not eye language, there's language between the eyes, eye contact, you know, that this in exchange between mother and baby, between teacher and child, between father and son, the child doesn't develop in the same kind of way. Pretty bizarre for me to realize, but it makes a lot of sense. And in a way, it's me understanding that my childhood trauma, especially my childhood trauma of being dissociated and derealized and alienated from my flesh and from the world. As far as I can tell, I may change this in the future, but I think I found it through some pretty intense research quite recently. I could never see. I had a habit of guessing. I had a habit of guessing if that would be my friend or not. And if you think of what would be happening when a baby's learning to crawl and the baby has a natural forward momentum to crawl towards mommy or daddy because they can see the face. What if you can't see the face? If you've ever searched for what's, what it's like to be legally blind or what it's like to have minus three, minus four vision, you can see that the world's a blob of colors. Or if you wear glasses, take them off. You know how bad it is. I'm currently around minus five prescription. I wear contact lenses. I never went through those developmental stages and unfortunately for my parents and unfortunately for me, it meant that I never bonded. Not particularly high charge negative, not particularly high charge, just no connection. The tether never extended. I was an emergency cesarean. Maybe that caused the blindness after 23 hours of labor. My head apparently got stuck. So I don't know if there was a pressure here and I went blind at the moment of birth. That's my childhood trauma. I didn't bond. And I struggled to live in the world. And only when I got my glasses at age 11 did the world finally become clear. And I sat down in the car outside of the shopping center. And I remember very clearly, pun intended, sitting down in the passenger seat, putting on those glasses for the first time and seeing a row of tall pine trees perfectly curated in a shopping center car park. And I said, wow, it's just like HDTV because that was starting to become a thing. I thought the reason that HDTV was so fascinating was because you could see better than humans could actually see. And the cameras were fantastic. Little did I know that you don't grow into your eyesight when you get older. I was actually pretty, pretty blind and legally speaking, legally blind until my eyesight got corrected at 11. So that's a story that I'm gonna work through. And um, yeah, fundamentally, not only was I a little bit blind or very blind as a child, um, 
I didn't like my father's anxiety, my father's anger, or my mother's anxiety, and the dynamics weren't that great, as you can probably tell from my discomfort. There was a variety of things that um, they tried their best. They, they genuinely did try their best. They did the best they could with their information, but knowing what I know now, I think lack of physical contact and probably insensitivity around language or the types of language which was coming in it was a bit too much for the sensitive boy that I was, so very introverted, very imaginal, and of course this is where the silver lining is. If you don't have an outer vision, by God's grace you develop an inner vision. Uh, I looked at the psychology of blind children or nearsighted children, visually challenged children, and you have to develop a conceptual system where you take blurry objects in the environment and make them clear in your imagination. So you can think of the power when I'm working with a client and they have a ambiguous shadow territory. And I say, hmm, that's blurry, but I think it could be this, and it seems to be just on the mark over and over again. So inner vision has its benefits. Um, definitely didn't experience that when I was a kid. Um, I'm sure I will speak about this more and more in the future. Fundamentally, I've been learning to get back in my body and also literally get into the world. That's been my challenge, and I'm pretty happy how things have turned out overall, but it was definitely pretty damn confusing for those first 11 years. Next question. What was your process over time for addressing your trauma? I know you value working out, and I wonder about an old video where you danced and did free movement. What was before that and in between? Did your process or practices change due to the books you read, Natural Evolution, or Following Curiosity? I would appreciate an overview of what you came across, tried, and why it worked for you and didn't, and techniques and activities. Very, very long question. Um, I can't answer this in full detail. In terms of what happened for my personal process, um, I got sober. That was a big one. I've been five and a half years sober at the time of recording. If I hadn't have cut out drink, drugs and substances and adult distractions, you know the type. If I hadn't have stopped wasting all my energy on those things, polluting and poisoning my system, I wouldn't have been able to deal with the rot inside of my heart. Hopefully you grasp that metaphor. If you're pouring oil into your broken psyche and you're putting all kinds of fireworks inside of the various corners of your dull, dark rooms inside of your mind, and you're expecting that that big flash of insight or that big exciting novel explosion is going to take you anywhere other than lots of ash on the floor and some damaged windows, just pay attention to what you're doing. If you're overcharging your system and your system's already covered in broken foundations, and it, just pay attention. If you haven't gone sober yet or you haven't become significantly sober-minded and you're trying to heal your trauma, that's the number one thing that I could recommend. Yes, I did embodiment practices. I did lots of movement. I sp I've spent months doing various things. I've done a variety of embodied movement. I've done a variety of bioenergetics. The reason I stand and do my videos is so that I can flow through the energy of conversation even then. Just a bit of this movement, a bit of forwards and backwards as a turning or a tilling of the energy and energy comes back in. When you've opened up and you cleared out, you will be able to receive and make use of energy that you didn't know was possible. And that same principle applies to clearing out old baggage, old energetic structures, old psychic thought forms from the past, clear out via sobriety, clear out via physical movement. And of course, as I read more and more over the years, I found particular subsections of movement psychology or um, existential map making that helped me to put things together. Fundamentally, those were variations on a theme. It's the 20% in the pie chart, just that small section over here. The main 80% was stop poisoning myself. Good idea. Have meaningful work that nourishes me with a sense of purpose and belonging and a sense of, oh, I'm doing something that matters. And initially that work was working on myself. It didn't matter what I was doing out in the outer world. It was very focused inner world, work, inner work. That was meaningful. And then eventually that became a career. Those two things together, fantastic. And then in terms of embodiment, obviously high quality food, going and moving, being out in nature. I spent, I suppose at this stage, I've spent four years walking barefoot, um, more or less every day. I used to do it in the winters. Um, now I'm a bit softer and not as tough as I used to be, so I don't go barefoot in the snow. I, I did for a period of time, but I realized it wasn't worth the health risks. Um, I go barefoot walking in my local English park which is 50 seconds away. I live rurally, so I have access to nature. I'm in an area of outstanding natural beauty, which is the technical classification for UK wildlife or country preserves. Outstanding natural beauty. So I go outside, I walk barefoot, I spend time in nature, I'm back in my flesh, and you spend enough 
cumulative hours enjoying the natural healthy human routine, no poison going in, earth and soil and ground being the supportive foundation that you walk upon literally, and healthy ideas, inspiring ideas, a, a feast of positive thoughts, they all stack up together, and that's more or less how I healed my trauma piece by piece, but a massive part of the trauma healing was indeed some existential trauma healing and understanding my role in the world, my sense of identity, and a reason to live overall. I'll move on to the next question because I think it relates to this. I'll bring it up on the screen so you can read it while I'm taking some tea. Firstly, thank you for the five-year anniversary. Congratulations. That middle question right there. How has your thinking, feeling, and behavior changed, and what kinds of changes has that produced in your outer reality? Um, following on from practical applications of books and things that have begun to change in my life. It's a broad question. Um, how has my healing and thinking all gone together? Um, very difficult to answer this because I've basically become a new man. If you had have been engaged in conversation with me before I started this library project, you would have gone a similar essence of Jordan. I had my drive, I had my passion, I had my core intelligence. I, I may not have been you know, physically the way that I am right now. I was a bit skinnier, I hadn't put on as much size. I'm currently 86 kilograms. I think back then I was probably around 76, 77 kilograms because I was leaner and traveling more, so I've bulked out. Um, I've still been training since I was 16 for anyone that's interested. It's just very difficult to keep on weight when you're traveling. Um, Bulked out, grounded in, become the man I'm meant to be, grown out full beard. All of these things have been changes in the last five years. You might say that's just physical changes, but it's also emotional, psychological changes. I have a theory that men, I'll speak for men in particular because I am a man, men don't grow into their full potential and their full strength if they're living a cowardly life. It's a controversial opinion, but if you're making cowardly decisions and if you're not speaking the truth that you know, you won't take up space, quite literally. Either you'll become fat and you'll spill over into space in a way which is unintentional because you're not looking after your body, or you'll remain skin and is skinny and small and you'll have this kind of scared, anxious, awkward posture, kind of all raised up. When you're living your truth and you are your truth and you're happy to be open to the world and be seen by the world, something happens inside of you where you become the man that you knew you were meant to be. And something like that has happened in my psyche in the last five years. I think really probably in the last three years, especially in the last two years since I've been committed with YouTube, as I've spoken my inner truth to the outer world and had more conversations, thousands and thousands and thousands of comment exchanges across YouTube, over 12,000 comments I've left on this channel in two and a half years, so my own channel, trying to have these conversations, having conversations in my DMs every single week, when I just tell the truth, when someone asks me a question, what do you think about this? And I share what I think about this, yes, because of some of the books that I've read, but also the application of those ideas. Are they healthy? Are they unhealthy? Does this serve life or does this serve death? And I separate out all these ideas and it becomes a sense of personal moral philosophy. And I speak the truth as best as I can in all those situations throughout the week, you gradually develop a sense of solidity, a sense of peace, a sense of centeredness, and a sense of yourself, which is irreplaceable and truly priceless. That is the main benefit of these last five years. I've become the man that I respect and love in a very deep way. Sometimes I don't respect the actions I take. and I've been trying my best to weed those out from my life. We're all making mistakes all of the time, but let's make sure those mistakes are minimal percentages in the grander scheme of our weekly behaviors. I'm like everyone else in that degree, but I think what I'm particularly strong on is I've been particularly ruthless about cutting away falsehood and fiction from the truth of what I am and what I want to do in this world. And I am fortunate and very intentional in having organized my entire life around the ability to be this version of myself rather than fragmenting myself in a career or a profession which forces me to put on the persona and be a fake little boy who's pretending to get along with big mommy or big daddy who pays my bills. 
I don't like that. You can see me, I get my hands on my hips. I think it's a waste of life for me personally, because that is not my path of expertise or my path of truth or my path of well-being and my reason to live. I just don't want to do that. So I've organized my life in a way where I get to speak what's true. Many, many variations just there on the same sentence over and over again. Just let it land. If there's been one thing that I've learned from all of these books, it's not about the books. The reason I've become the man that I am, the reason I get to enjoy this kind of life is because I made the choice to prioritize doing something as weird as reading over 700 psychology books and devoting my life to spending a lot of time alone with dead authors and dead teachers because that's what I knew I needed to do. Your path might look different. Probably will. I hope it does. Otherwise, you're probably not doing an authentic path because you're just hearing my ideas and thinking that that's what you need to do. But we need to start somewhere. Whatever it might be, just make sure it's your authentic spark. Let it, let it burn. Add more wood. Let it become a bonfire. And from that bonfire of authenticity, you will feel the warmth on the inside. And don't be surprised when people gather around you, friends, family, and then strangers from around the world, and they want to put their hands to that flame and take a little bit, a little bit of that warmth for themselves, because that's what we're doing here. Each, each of us is doing that in a different way. And that's, um, it's a beautiful path to be walking. So I hope that you do that. And if you're not doing that to the fullest extent that you could right now, just remember that you've only got so many decades of life and eventually... There will be a wind that comes which blows out that flame and you will not have the flint to reignite. Don't waste the opportunity. Next question. How do I concentrate on so many books at a time? There's two answers to this question. Nice superficial breaking it up. In terms of literally how many books I read at once, I've got five books which we're going to end this video on. I probably read, let me have a look at my desk. I've got one, two, three, four, five, one in the porch. Five or six. I read five or six books at once and they usually pick a variety of themes. So I'll have a trauma healing work, I'll have something that's Jungian, I'll have something that's transpersonal, I'll have something that's spiritual, I'm currently working through the Christian canon, I'll have something that's entrepreneurial, business focused, and I might have some general interest on sociology or history or whatever it might be. I'll read five or six books at once. Currently, in terms of how do I concentrate on so many books at once, my reading pace is anywhere between three to five first reads per week. That's because I take three days offline intentionally by design to read for eight plus hours per day. And even when I'm online, like today, I still picked up two books, went in and out of them. I still read. I, I, I read all the time. I, I enjoy it. So it's not that difficult to concentrate on so many books at once. I I flow with the theme. If in the morning I want to read about trauma, because that's what I do, especially for multiple years, my Monday offline day off from the week is let's read two trauma books back to back. And that's what I've enjoyed because I enjoy learning and I enjoy getting good at this and getting better at this and helping more people with high quality information. That's how I do it. I concentrate because I care. How do I do on so many books at once? Yes, they're different themes, but as I mentioned, Jungian psychology, transpersonal psychology, trauma work, somatic trauma work, something related to history. It's all humanities. It all ties back to my history degree and my conditioning to look for the human. Even when I'm looking at business books or entrepreneurial insights, it's still business psychology. All, of business, all the business books are business psychology. It's either your psychology of why you're getting in your own way or the psychology of the market, the psychology of the customer. It's still humans. I'm not reading books on engineering or chemical processes or um, I don't even know. I, I, I'm specialized in humanities. I, I read the humanities as philosophy sometimes, as theology. I concentrate on so many books at once because for me, they're all fundamentally one big book. This entire library is one big book. And that's what it feels like. So it's not difficult to concentrate when it's all just the same book. Maybe I just flip around between the chapters, but it feels pretty natural for me. Next question. Congrats, Jordan, with hands raised up. Thank you. How has this process and learning impacted your self-trust and ability to connect with and understand others? As I mentioned in the previous response, when you feel like you're more or less authentic, when your digital persona or your social persona is no longer out here, no longer this close, but as close to your skin as you could possibly make it, and you present that version of yourself to the world because that is who you actually are, it's very easy to trust yourself and connect with other people because they sense the realness of your character. You also develop an ability to really, oh, 
I can smell in authenticity. I can smell the persona. I can smell the game. I can sense what they're doing because you know what it feels like to be very close from your inner expression and your outer expression, your self-concept within and who people are responding to. You, you get a real sense for that. So it means that you develop very authentic connections with other authentic people that are here to find if you find them. Make sure they become best friends because they are rare to find. But if you find them and you're one of them and you can be that kind of authentic best friend for someone, it's easy to trust yourself, trust other people and connect with them like this because it's real. Real attracts real. That's how my process and my learning, me becoming the man that I was meant to be, all these psychology ideas around trauma healing has fundamentally just helped me to bring my inner world and outer world into union and be honest about who I am. And at this stage in my life, I don't really tolerate time with people who are dishonest about who they are. My closest male and female friends are very much themselves. And I don't have to go into environments by design. I don't have to go into environments where people are doing all this nonsense. I, I, I think it's I think it's so silly. Even when I'm at the gym, I'm at the gym and I'll listen to my weird like 1980s uh like goth wave music or some metal core or something really ambient and I'm listening to like a musical soundtrack or something and I'm doing some muscle ups or doing some handstands someone walks in and I'll just talk like I talk right now and some of my friends are like, who is this guy I don't know my general response has been that when I am myself even in gym environments or public environments I would rather cause an impression where someone's like that guy's a bit weird and that guy is not calibrated at all than sacrifice my own feeling of authenticity because enough people via the internet via my clients via my close connections they mirror and validate that we like Jordan the way that he actually is so I don't care what the majority of strangers who I interact with once or twice care about. I hope that I leave a good impression. I don't try and be obnoxious in an outbound sense but if someone asks my opinion on something and I'm not feeling particularly English and particularly polite I will say pretty honestly no I don't think that's a good idea. I'm willing to rock the boat a bit especially if it comes to a big political issue or it comes to something which um, would infringe upon my autonomy. Not that we had any events within recent years where there was a global infringement of autonomy where we all had to make individual decisions not that any of those come to my mind but if a situation like that were to come to mind you better make sure that you know who you are you better trust your own decision making ability and when you trust your own decision making ability you know that when you're being offered things that aren't quite adding up that you shouldn't take the jab quite literally just pay attention to the things and you'll be pretty good in the world. I'll leave it there. You can sense where that video would go, but we'll save that for another time. I don't want to get my channel taken down. Unfortunately, that's the way things are. Next question. How did you get your business up and running? Is it hard to convince? It is hard to convince people you're worth being coached by. As savage as my answer might be, it is not hard to convince people you're worth being coached by if you're somebody who's good at coaching. I've never tried to convince people that I'm going to be their best life coach. I let them make their own decision. You can see in my pinned comment, I've got a long mentorship description. It's pretty expensive to work with me because I give four months of my life on a week by week basis, applying all of these shortcuts in a way that gives over a year of transformation. I feel confident saying that. I've had dozens and dozens and dozens of client journeys to confirm this. That's where I am now. It's not hard to convince people to get coached by me or listen to me. You're still listening at this point in the video. I'm sharing for free. I'm sharing information for here for free. Even in a paid situation where you're working with me one to one, it's clear that I'm giving value and it's hopefully clear that I have more or less the answers that you came in with. And if I don't have the answer, I don't lie to you and make something up. I work with you to find out the answer. I, I'm really interested in alliance and deep mentorship. If you have an issue on a certain niche thing that comes up two months into the mentorship, I'm going to spend some of my offline time researching that so we can both benefit. That's the kind of man that I am, which then goes back to the question of, well, why is it hard to convince people to get coached by you? You're probably not a very good person just yet. You're not a leader. If you're not a leader and you're not inspiring, and you're not, you're not, you're not the man or the woman that you would be inspired to work with. That's all you need to focus on. The technical aspect of building out a business, building out a coaching structure in particular or a therapeutic practice, you either have some credentials that you use to set up your practice and you do it all in the traditional formal institutional way. That's one way of doing it. For my way personally, me setting up a coaching service and saying, hey, fundamentally, you can pay me money to spend time with me and I'll answer questions or share things that I know 
it's no more complex than being an example of that and actually having the energy and the information to be worth the money. And you keep raising your prices as you refine your skills, you refine over time both the price and the skill set. If you're struggling to get clients, the best reflection I could give to you is, are you the man or the woman that you would pay at this price point to solve these issues? Better yet, are you the man or the woman that you feel inspired by to want to work with, to want to talk to, to want to emulate? If not, then that's the issue. It's a pretty straightforward, maybe somewhat firm response, but I wouldn't have paid the rate that I charge right now to work with me four years ago because I didn't have the skill. I wasn't the man. Now I am. In the future, by God's grace, there'll be higher paying coaching situations for a different offer that I can't foresee because I'll have grown my influence. And as you give more and more to the world, more and more comes back to you. I, I love that reciprocity of money and business and intentional ethics in trading, trading energies, trading money. It grows if you're tapped into it. That's how I live. So I really don't try and convince people I'm worth coaching by, at least in the explicit. You'll see even in my pinned comment, I actually focus primarily on excluding people. I say that this isn't good for you. If you want to do drink and drugs, this isn't good for you. If you don't enjoy reading for 90 minutes, two hours a day, I'm not a good person for you to work with. If you're not interested in four months of more or less relentless, intensive inner work, I'm someone that people come to multiple years deep in the journey. When the old therapist isn't working anymore, when you can't feel that sense of how that person gets it when you're looking at other life coaches, my clients come to me in that moment consistently, repeatedly. They say they've been watching me for a year, year and a half, and then they reach out. Or they say, I knew from the look in your eyes and the way that you spoke that you are the real deal. Look how long this video is. I couldn't fake this. So if you feel like you're faking it, you probably are faking it. If you can't record to a camera for at least 10 minutes talking about your principles and sharing your values, it's not yet embodied and that's okay. You can work on that. That's the part of becoming a real coach, becoming the real deal. Just don't try and shortcut that process. If you're not getting clients, if you're not going anywhere online, just try and pause and think about what you're doing offline and who you actually are. It all eventually comes back together. Next question. What led me to working on myself in a serious way and what was life like before you pursued such dedicated work? As I mentioned throughout this video, I had a pretty depressive and dark childhood, which I now realize was technically a legally blind childhood. I mean, I don't know, but by the age of three or four, I couldn't see anything. So it was a pretty blurry world. That's, um, that much is clear. Ironic. That much is clear. The blurring is clear. What pushed me to do such dedicated work? Initially it was desperation, but then quite transparently, I have had a more or less consistent, but nonetheless infrequent relationship with my soul. And to whatever degree, I may be lucky to receive an impression um, of a God-given message, God-given direction. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what the language is for that, but I've felt consistently, at least for the last five years, but even when I was 21 finishing university, go this way, Jordan. And I just listened. And I, I was willing to turn away the things that weren't that feeling and that weren't that deep sensation. I just, I just went with it. And I've, I've continually gone with that. I go with that feeling, that intuition, that soul voice when I'm choosing clients. When I'm choosing which video to make, it's, it's more or less consistent in my daily life in a very small series of intuitions that go on throughout the week. And then the big questions like, what am I doing here? What's my mission? What's my service? What should I be doing here for the next six decades? Listen outwards, listen inwards. And that helps me to work on myself in such a serious way. I suppose the best way to wrap up this question, how do I work on myself in a serious way? I take myself seriously. I rejected pretty strongly when I went sober this idea that it's okay to wake and bake. It's okay to go and get drunk on the weekends because you've worked hard. I think it's silly. I can respect why people do that. And I think it's sad that you feel that you need to go and hurt your body, hurt your senses to get some kind of relief from a life that you don't enjoy waking up to every day. 
I've found that when I've worked with people and they become healthier and more aligned in their career choices, healthier and more aligned in their relationships, their taste for self-destruction diminishes. They no longer want to get stoned or get drunk because they have tasted something better and that taste is authentic love and authentic being and authentic relationship to themselves, to the people who are close to them and to the world at large and dare I say it, to God above and God within. You, you lose the taste for it, so you take it seriously. Because you're engaged in life in a serious way doesn't mean that you can't have fun. Of course there's plenty of fun in my life. Of course there's playfulness. I was just sending some voice notes before this to somebody who could potentially be a friend. I don't know. Someone I'm connected with over on Instagram. I like sending out voice notes to people. I send out dozens of like little messages every week. And I'm just trying to be playful and send some insights. And like, hey, here's this. And I'm going to like, I'm in the flow. It's, it, it's easy to be in the flow when you take life very seriously. At the deeper level, the big, the big questions you take seriously, and then as a result of that, it's very simple to organize your week based on pretty reliable principles that you don't take for granted. So yeah, that's my answer. How do I become dedicated to the work that I'm doing? You become aware of that voice which is saying, go this way, don't go that way. Some people would say this is the voice of God, others would say it's the voice of my soul. Others would say it's just good intuition or a gut knowing. If you follow that voice for years in a row, you won't be led astray. You might make a stumble. That classic Carl Jung quote of intuition can either hit the target directly or be a mile off into the forest. It's either completely on the mark or completely off the mark. Sometimes you get it wrong, but your hit rate will be over the 80% mark and it will be easy. It, it, it will just be easy. It doesn't mean there won't be a lot of work, but you'll know. You'll know and you'll know when you're lying to yourself as well. Next question. How did you integrate intellectual understanding into your emotional system and the mind-body connection? It's been my experience that all the therapists I've used have told me to stop reading because understanding intellectual is not the goal of integrational therapeutic work from imbalances and repressed or suppressed emotions. Fantastic question. It's one of these strange things that I hear from people who are doing more conventional therapy, especially if they've just, just made the transition from, say, conventional CBT style therapy to then the beginnings of somatic therapy, that kind of entry level somatic therapy where you're encouraged to not read books. Or maybe a spiritual therapist says, don't read books, they're all things of the ego and they will lead you astray and you just need to meditate or you need to do this certain shamanic ritual, this certain witchy practice, or in the case of somatics, this certain bodily movement, this certain breathwork. Even there, just a, just a bit of breath, that, that's powerful, and that's real. I've done something to my system with a small moment of focus, but there are different tools for different issues. And if you're suffering from existential issues, you don't know who you are, what you are, or where your place in the world is, you can get a sense of solidity from grounding in your body. You can work on the muscular armor in an Alexander Lowen, Wilhelm Reich, somatic therapy kind of way. You can build relationships through conscious communication through your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. You can do all of that. You can build the deep connections. But if you're not paying attention to the existential, to the ideas, to the world of cognition, in addition to those practices, you'll be left empty. So for me personally, what I try and do, because I'm a very intellectually oriented man, is I take ideas at the theoretical level, I test them for truth, and again that intuition comes through, so I test for truth, I test for um, information from a more scientific or more detached lens, I compare and contrast, and then I try it out in my body, I try it out in my relationships, and over time the holistic world starts to be built. If you've got a therapist who's saying don't read books because they're all a distraction, or you shouldn't work on books because you're really struggling in a relationship, what's another book going to do? It might be appropriate. It might be appropriate if you've got a five book per week reading habit and you're having arguments with your spouse every single day and you've got no money because you've got a crappy job or something. I, I get it. It's appropriate in those scenarios if you're escaping real life and real somatic healing because you're reading too many books, you could probably do with the encouragement to slow down. I've worked with clients who've read many, many books. I had one particular client that I think of, that individual read dozens of books for, that I've recommended on this channel before they contacted me and I caught within the first session, within the first coffee chat, I had a situation where I thought, this person's like this, but then the actual first formal session we agreed together. Huh. If I encourage them, 
if I listen to them and say, yes, okay, we'll get your two to three book per week reading habit. And part of my mentorships is I usually recommend at least one book, if not two books per week that people read between the weekly sessions, very intense process, customized curated reading list. If I do this for this person, we're missing the point of their inner work at the next level, that advanced level. They actually needed to get into their body. They needed a flesh healing. They needed bone healing. So we hold off on the ideas. And then later on in the mentorship, over halfway in, we do more ideas. But fundamentally, they needed to do somatic therapeutic work. So I didn't recommend loads and loads of books. That's appropriate in a certain situation. That's one client out of dozens of clients. There's some variations of a handful of clients who I've done similar things with. But most people, when they're coming to me, and they've had several previous therapists, several previous coaches, or they've been living um, even a very intentional life, but they haven't gone deep into research. They don't yet know the wealth of ideas that's out there. The last 120 years of psychology, imagine that. The best thinkers from around the world, men and women who've devoted decades to the craft, and they write a book. You can read, and you can feast on their refined thoughts. And they answer questions through their case studies that you'd been considering for years yourself. And they just give it to you. It's the same as therapy. Just think of it like that where you go to a therapist, ask a question. Hmm, yes. Mm, oh, how about this? And then you go backwards and forwards. Hmm. After half an hour, you found the answer. A good therapeutic writer will walk you through that process over multiple pages because they've seen the pattern and they can translate it into words. That's why it's worth reading books. That's why bibliotherapy is very much a thing. So for me personally, I learned through the first couple hundred books, that bibliotherapeutic self-healing process. And then as I've gone deeper into my professional practice, naturally, I then get to a point where I'm understanding the material, I'm applying the material and you refine and you refine and you refine. But fundamentally, if you're looking for holistic health, work holistically with the different tools that are available for you. Do Jungian therapy for your dream work. Do somatic trauma release when you're working on your issues around your nervous system responses. Do breath work to support that. But if you're going into existential work, look at philosophy, look at theology, look at the deep, dark questions that we refuse to answer. And again, then zoom back out and you've got a conversation with your husband or your wife, your boyfriend, or your girlfriend. It's time to go into relationships to tantric teachers, perhaps to go to workshops, many different methods. That's how you do it. You build the mind body connection by working with the mind and the body, closing the duality, bringing in the soul and working from every level, every line, every layer in union. And it takes years. Honestly, it takes years. I think the best estimates are that focused work will take at least three years, if not three to six years, if you're doing consistent work on a week by week basis to deal with major traumas and reach towards major potentials but I hope that helps. Next question on the screen. What is my typical daily schedule and routines? I'm wondering how you sustain a high level of quality output and what your work and recovery routines are like. I answered this question in the previous Q&A. Again, go down into the channel and you'll be able to find my response to my daily and weekly routine. It depends on the week. I have online time, offline time. Currently at the time of recording, I cut my week in half. I take three and a half, four days offline from social media and now from YouTube. I don't talk to clients for three and a half days. I just go offline, hermit mode, I read books. I talk about all that in the other video. Um, what I'm going to focus on for this question is my work and recovery routines, because I think this is the most interesting part that I don't get to talk about too often. I have philosophies of exertion and recovery, which I think are common sense. I think it's common sense, but I don't think it's common. I think there's a lot of shame that people have, even very high achieving type A individuals who are hard chargers, they're go-getters, they want to do a lot. They have shame around rest. What I mean by this is they don't have the ability to follow the impulse of tiredness and sleep when they need to sleep. Take a nap when they need to take a nap, take a break when they need to take a break. And they get caught in this perpetual unconscious cycle of overworking and crashing because they don't have energy management throughout the day and throughout the week. At this time in my life, I sleep on average at least nine hours per day. If I factor in naps, I probably sleep about nine and a half to 10 hours a day sometimes. I'll have a cadence to my day where I will work very productively and then I'll slow it down and take a walk and then I'll have some food and then I'll take a nap. And I know I can do this because I'm privileged to have my certain type of lifestyle. But if you're a high achievement kind of individual and you have freedom of your schedule to some degree, see what happens if you give yourself permission to take a nap 
or to eat even higher quality food or to know when to take a day off, to know when to take a vacation. There's usually childhood trauma associated with the shame around overproductivity. I've met people who say they can't take a nap or they couldn't possibly take this day off or, or alternatively, they need to take loads of days off. It can go in both, excuse me, it can go in both directions. They like, say I'm burping up, I can't even, can't even take the idea down that you need overrest or underrest. My relationship to work and recovery is that I listen to my body while nonetheless having a baseline level of discipline that I consistently push over the years to know what I'm actually capable of. I've got five books in front of me. And next question, we're going to be going into it. If I go offline for this material, maybe not because some of these books are more complex. If I truly took a focused three and a half days offline with the exception of this one book, I could read these four books cover to cover at deep level of engagement while also enjoying workouts and tending to other things and doing some things on the business. I can do, I can read this. I know that I can quite enjoyably and quite comfortably do a lot in a short period of time. And yet I'm also aware that I need a lot of sleep in the evenings. I don't pollute my system with drink and drugs. I have a good energetic routine and I look after myself and I have a pretty healthy lifestyle overall. So that's where I can do it. Find the balance between work and recovery means that you have to find the balance on the inside and you have to look at the shame-based narratives of overproductivity or overproduction and watch out for those times when you're denying yourself recovery or conversely, watch out for the times when you're bypassing a bit of hard work because you're actually caught in, a, let's call it an apathetic pattern where it's not necessarily laziness, but you're caught in a low-grade apathy which you haven't quite worked through. There are many reasons to do a lot of work in this life. And if you can find an avenue of expression, you'll be able to do a lot. And you also need to know when to rest. If you don't have that ability to work for long hours, it's probably something that you don't care about enough. Maybe the secondary gains of financial victories or the kinds of trips you can take are motivating enough for you. But people who are watching this channel, especially yourself, especially anyone who's gotten this deep into a Q&A video, Find your productive lane of productivity based on authentic intentions, authentic desires, and you won't struggle to, to work. You might struggle to rest, in which case, be kind on yourself, be self-loving, but that's as best as I can do. And I try and maintain that rhythm throughout the days, and I'm also aware that I've got many decades of this, so what's the rush? And yet also, time is running out. It's all a paradox. Final, final question. We've made it, and this one's even longer than the previous Q&A been teasing these books throughout what were your key takeaways from king warrior magician lover by robert moore and are there any other more influential books for you what i've decided to do is get king warrior magician lover by robert moore which is the classic jungian psychology take on the masculine archetypes the king the warrior the magician and the lover the four quadrants of the male psyche in their light and dark expressions this is a book about what it means to be an immature man growing into a mature man. And if you haven't picked up this book already and you're a man learning to be more of the man you're meant to be, or a woman who loves men, your son, your brother, your husband, your boyfriend, your father, pick up this book. It's a classic. It's 200 pages. You've seen it before. This is the book to read. I've picked up many things from this book, but fundamentally I've picked up a framework for understanding the archetypal energies of masculinity while also balancing myself out against the qu four quadrants. Technically speaking, my understanding of this material is that the king is the central axis, which is supported by the warrior, the magician, and the lover. If one side is fallen, then the king cannot stand tall. The king in his fullness truly is supported by the other three aspects of the psyche in their appropriate measure, depending on the season of life. I've got a few more books. I decided to pick out my library that relate to the King, Warrior, Magician, Lover theme. One book, roughly speaking, for each of those archetypal energies. And I'm going to briefly give them to you as a final way of wrapping up this video. If you've chosen to skip all the way to this point, then you've done something very tactical. If you stuck around all the way to the end, these are four books which have influenced me. And they are hopefully going to answer the question in terms of the lover energy, healing from immature, unhealthy shadow lover into hopefully mature, whatever lover I may or may not be. Cupid's Poisoned Arrow is the book that I want you to read. And this is the book that changed my mind around adult distractions and particularly retention. I always hesitate to mention this because it sounds like it's not true or it sounds like I'm trying to do something. But this time of recording, I am... Da, 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 October, no, 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 no. I'm three months away from five years of unbroken retention practice. 
while being active in my dating life. Five years of not busting nuts, doing different things, understanding what energy can be if you decide to not spill yourself unconsciously. Many ups and downs in that process, quite literally many ups and downs, but if you read a book like Hubert's Poisoned Arrow, you will understand the deeper principles of retention, or maybe not this book, this is, this is me overselling this book. This book was the gateway, the gateway into the practice of really committing to Carezza, to non-ejaculatory ways of engaging with my own sensuality, or also any woman that I'm with, just not, not being in that mentality of chase it to the high and release it. If you understand that deeper principle, it's not about a roller coaster to the top to enjoy it for a few seconds and then it crashes. You can build an entire life around that practice, energetically speaking. What have I done for the last five years of this library project? If not, not chase the high and then crashed, I've just maintained a steady flow, energetically speaking. How do you think I can read so many books in sh such a short period of time, reread 164 of them, do all of this while building an online business from nothing, building my client rate from £25 an hour to over 10 times that, building these practices and just pay attention. If you're a man who hasn't figured out retention, please go into it. I know it's tough. I know those first 60 days of getting rid of adult attractions are difficult. I really struggled with that. I struggled with it for many, many, many years. But please pay attention. Cut it out. It's a waste of your time. You can get a lot done. And for me personally, several months in, when I really cut it away and I really made the choice to stop being wasteful with my energy, with my focus, with my projected fantasy, I started to truly love myself as a man. I looked myself in the mirror and I smiled on the inside. It's worth it. Warrior energy. I'm going to go with some money-making energy and we're going to go for million dollar consulting. I haven't actually got a perfect book for this category. There's a couple dozen books on money and entrepreneurship inside this library. This one is the closest book that I could recommend. Fundamentally, if you're a warrior in the modern day, you have your training, you have your ability to be a literal warrior if you choose the path of being in the army, but fundamentally it's mostly about money. Early on, it's about your relationship with money, your ability to go and gather resources and use those resources for the benefit of yourself and other people. If you're a coach, I recommend you read this book. If you're not a coach, you may not want to read this book. But the idea of million dollar consulting is at least worth talking about. I see the self-actualized individual, the man or the woman who is self-actualized, has an ability to be able to generate money in an intentional and consistent way. That's warrior energy for me. Archetypally speaking, the world of business, the world of entrepreneurship has that warrior charge. Yes, it becomes a kingly energy. Yes, it draws upon different types of energy. But money itself, as a man, has that, that, that energy behind it. Just look at your money wounds. For me personally, I've learned how to make money, learning how to then invest money, keep money, learning about stocks and shares, learning about different tax strategies or legal strategies, working with my accountant, learning the world, learning the battlefield of business, let's say. That's something essential. But of course, to be a warrior, you eventually need to have your sight on becoming a king. So one of my favorite business books I'm going to recommend, really influential for me, again, King Warrior, Magician Lover. This is the modern king on the internet. Daniel Priestley is key person of influence. I really enjoy Daniel Priestley's work because he has a sense of soul behind his entrepreneurship. This book was a book that for me made me realize that through YouTube in particular, I'd have an ability to express what may be a late princely energy or an early kingly energy. I'm definitely not in my full kingly energy, archetypally speaking. You have to go through a stage of princehood to then become a king. How many kings were crowned at age 10 only to be murdered by their evil uncle 10 years later, five years later? Who knows? The best kings come into their maturity, psychologically speaking, a little bit later into their adult life. I think for me personally, I don't believe the true kingly energy for men turns on if properly cultivated still. It doesn't turn on until mid-30s at the earliest, sometimes in the 40s, sometimes for some men in some professions, it takes until your 50s. But the key person of influence idea is that you can use your kingly energy, you can create a kingdom online and a kingdom that flourishes at that. You can look after your people, you bring them in, you give them the wealth that you've discovered and they go off and they prosper and you look after your kingdom. Think of why I've left over 12,000 comments on my own channel. 
why I make so much free material on YouTube, why I'm interested in building community. For me, it's a practice of kingly energy. If we look at game, I think this is the book. Where is it? There it is. King, warrior, magician, lover. If you read this book, there's an idea of giving blessings. The king gives blessings to his people. A truly selfish king, a malicious, tyrannical shadow king is not what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for the healthy king, the radiant king. We look at stories from mythology and stories from popular media, Aragorn, Maximus from Gladiator, William Wallace, Braveheart, literal kings throughout history, queens as well if you want to look into the feminine side. They serve their people, not themselves, but they also become rich and happy and fulfilled in servicing the kingdom. That's what I try and do with the key person of influence idea and then it ties into the magician and for me this is one of my top books, you may have seen me recommend it recently, The Living Classroom by Christopher Back. This is gold for teachers understand the nature of collective consciousness and the subtle energetics of thought forms when you're teaching if you read a book like this it might be a bit expensive maybe it's 20 dollars. maybe it's 30 dollars. doesn't matter this book influenced my teaching before i even started youtube i read christopher's ideas as a university lecturer who was teaching religion if i if i'm correct teaching religion at university while also being transpersonally informed he allows you to see what can't be seen. The way that words and ideas and stories weave between the minds and the hearts of your students. The way that you can build networks of information. That's what I've done with this channel. From the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to do something intentional and something which amplified this energy that I had inside. This idea, these books, they're all secondary to some degree. Yes, I know that I've led with the books, but if I had just purely led with the books, you probably wouldn't have stayed around on this channel. You come for the book and you come for me and my discussion about the book and you go down to the comments and see other people doing it. It's the living classroom. The cover indicates the contents. One of my favorite books of all time, and I hope that this has answered the King, Warrior, Magician, Lover energy. Very fitting that I finished this long Q&A video, the longest video that I've ever produced. I thought the previous video from last week at 61 minutes, 71 minutes was the longest I produced this one, was well over that. I do it because I'm creating a classroom, an energetic school, the library, the office, the seminar room. I extend it and it feels so good. It's where I'm meant to be. So if you're looking to become a magician in the world, if you're looking to use your brain and use your spiritual powers and your energetic possibilities to make good for other people, consider using technology again, the realm of the magician, social media, screens, electricity, those are all magician qualities. Combine that with the warrior's drive, the ability to make, receive and play with money. Combine that with the healthy lover energy who isn't spilling your seed in places you shouldn't be spilling it either into the tissues or women who aren't worth your time. Look at that. Again, all of these principles apply to any woman who's watching. Just look at who you let into your body. If they shouldn't be there, don't allow them to be there. If you're over sensual, if you're too indulgent, just take it back a bit. Likewise, if you're too cold and you're not sensual enough, just bring it out a little bit more. Men and women can learn from the same principles. I hope this helps. Fundamentally, it's been a pleasure to put this Q&A together. I'm amazed that I've managed to do this. This is truly a milestone of teaching for me. So once again, I will end it on the final frame with Living Classroom by Christopher Back. This is, this is the framework, the blueprint, quite literally, the blueprint. I'll see you on the next video. And if you haven't watched the Q&A from before, go down to the channel right now, click on there. You've got another 71 minutes of me in a black shirt talking about more of my research process and personal spiritual practices and things like this. Here's to the next five years.